Hey everybody, how's it going? And welcome back to my channel, Reading in the Dark. Finally, after quite a bit of a hiatus, um, I actually have a new roommate in my house and I am trying not to keep him awake uh, as he's on a very early schedule temporarily. So I've been a little bit delayed um, and I've also been kind of delayed with these videos because I have re recently taken part in two readathons. I did book two -a which was the last week of July. Um, and then I also went right into Thriller-a-thon, which I started before I had even finished my seventh and final book for book two -a I read like five of them and then I reread a separate piece by John Knowles. And then I read the sixth book, and then I was about to read the seventh book, which was Hannah Green and Her Unfeasibly Mundane Existence by Michael Marshall Smith. And I decided, ooh, I know, before I do that, since I'm already behind anyway, I want to join this Thriller-a-thon. So I joined the Thriller-a-thon, and I read five Thriller books. Then I read Hannah Green. I suppose I could have just done a wrap-up when the date of booktube thon was over, and then just been like, well, I got through four and a half books, which I think is what happened. Uh, but I didn't. I decided to just like finish them and then make the video because I am a completionist. So this is going to be my very belated uh, wrap up um, for Booktubeathon. Booktubeathon, of course, is hosted by Ariel Bissett. So for Booktubeathon this year, I followed these seven challenges uh, mostly. The first challenge was let a coin toss decide your first read, and that resulted in me reading The Hunger Games by Suzanne Collins. The second challenge was read a book about something you want to do. And so I chose Nixia because that involves people going into outer space. The third challenge was read and watch a book to movie adaptation. And so I chose Mildred Pierce. Read a book with green on the cover, Hannah Green, and her unfeasibly mundane existence. Obviously, it has green on the cover and the word green. Read a book with a beautiful spine, A Knight of the Seven Kingdoms by George R.R. R. Martin, because it has a pretty tree on the side. And then, uh, oh, read a book while wearing a hat. The same hat the whole time. Failed, didn't do that. Seven, read seven books. Okay, failed, didn't do that. But I did try and eventually read the seven books, which is why this wrap up has been delayed. Um, starting in the order that I read the books. The first book that I read was The Hunger Games by Suzanne Collins. Now, The Hunger Games is a book that I bought the ebook for a very, very long time ago. I never read it, but I went to go see the second movie and in the theater when it came out. So this was years ago. And I thought, ooh, I should read these. And then uh, before they make the third movie, which then became the third and the fourth. Um, so I finally read it. Um, I wanted to get it off my TBR. And for all of these readathons, I basically try to choose books that are in my TBR that I have had um, the longest and try to find books in that list that match the challenges. So The Hunger Games, I really, really liked. I liked it more than I expected to. It's an interesting sort of discussion of like the wealth disparity in the world um, taken to a sort of dystopian, <laughs> more dystopian, almost kind of ridiculous level. I mean, one issue that I have with Hunger Games is that the wealth disparity is a little bit extreme to the point where I kind of feel like this country of Panem seems to spend an enormous amount of resources keeping people in line and like picking up dead bodies of people who starve to death and like putting on this these games when I almost sort of feel like it would be equally beneficial to keeping the rich people rich if they were to just make food dispensers in the poor areas and keep people in line by, you know, threatening to cut off their supply of food or whatnot. Just the amount of technology that they have makes it seem like it would be pretty easy for them to just generate food and just give, I don't know. It, it seems like a, a culture with that level of technology wouldn't have any shortage of food. And then the point of denying access to that food to certain segments of the population seems somewhat less demonstrably clear to me. Just to throw in some extra words. Um, so yeah, I mean, I don't know. But that's, I'm kind of missing the point. The point is it's a sort of, you know, essay on the distribution of wealth and and food and and whatnot and that's certainly relevant to our world so i enjoyed that aspect of it i kind of hate love triangles so i didn't love that aspect but i did like a couple of things about the love triangle situation in hunger games between pita hate that name and um <laughs> lead katniss um one thing i liked is that it was not a love at first sight situation i like the fact that her like appreciation and admiration and sort of uh, tenderness towards Pita 
comes from a valid place of sort of feeling honor bound due to him having given her bread when she was really starving and suffering earlier on and she, you know, him having sort of extended a kindness to her. Um, and so that was a little bit more interesting than if she had just been like, oh my God, he's so cute. Um, I also liked the fact that she did not wear her heart on her sleeve during the games. She She's playing the game and she's the one who seems to act a little bit more surprised that he's not acting when the games are over as opposed to the other way around. I would have expected maybe in a less original story with less original characters, perhaps that the girl would be the one who was like, wait a minute, I thought you loved me. And then he would be like, uh, just playing a game. Although I will say that Pita's character is a little bit um, difficult to understand. His feelings for her seem to kind of come out of nowhere, but that's, I don't know, as far as straight people go, like I don't necessarily understand where these feelings come from sometimes in books and in movies, because I don't see it coming because I'm just not attuned to it maybe. In any case, it could have been worse. And I like the fact that romance isn't her goal there. She's not, you know, she doesn't get caught up in it. She's more concerned about you know, winning or surviving and, and concerned about taking care of her sister and her mother. The book, I mean, you know, it was an action adventure and it had a message and a sort of, it's kind of an allegory for our world and it was made up of ideas that were valid and worth thinking about. And so that automatically makes it um, more successful as a speculative fiction or sci-fi than a lot of other things that I have read. So I really enjoyed The Hunger Games more than I thought I would. And I gave it four stars. The next book that I read was Mildred Pierce by James M. Kane. Um, Mildred Pierce was amazing. It was so good. I don't even have that much to say about it. It is a historical novel um, about a woman named Mildred Pierce who has a terrible husband and leaves him uh, to basically be free and raise her daughter, Veda. And, um, and they, actually they have two children and she starts a business, she starts a restaurant, um, and it becomes successful, and her relationship with her daughter becomes very strained, and it is a fascinating character study. Her relationship with Veda is one of the most, like, it's just a fascinating relationship, very original, and my jaw was hanging open half the time I read this book. Um, I loved the the setting, I loved the, I loved the time period, you know, um, and this was the book that I was reading as watch a film, a book to film adaptation. And I actually did not get around to watching the film adaptation. There's a film adaptation with I think Betty Davis. And then there is a, an HBO mini series with, uh, uh, Kate Winslet. And I want to watch both of them, but I did not watch them yet. So in any case, Mildred Pierce, it's like sweeping and kind of romantic. And it's just like intrigue and backstabbing and you go girl and like just so good and the relationship between her and her daughter and the roads that they go down I mean wow I finished that book like <gasps> I loved it and I gave it five stars read it read it read it it is so good the next book that I read was this little sci-fi tome called Nixia and um, by uh, Scott Reinchen, maybe. Um, so this book was fun. It's set in the future. There are these kids who are chosen to be members of this elite team to go to this other planet and interact with this substance called Nixia which can be controlled by your mind and used for things and is very valuable. And it's a very dangerous mission, but they're gonna get a lot of money. It's also a material that doesn't belong to us on a planet inhabited by an alien species that has given us boundaries of areas that we are allowed to mine, Nix uh, to mine Nixia and areas where we are not. And they have figured out um, how to just basically take it from all the places that we want and ignore that. Um, and so that's why it's dangerous because you have to fight. So basically the goal in mind is to steal stuff from an indigenous species. And most of the book is a competition between all of these potential candidates for this mission who are trying to be one of the 10 that are gonna make it onto the final mission, onto the actual crew. 
but I didn't really like it that much, and there are a few reasons for that. This book, first of all, the mission is a very immoral one. We're just going to steal shit from aliens who have told us that we can't have this stuff, but we're just going to take it anyway. Um, and it's all for money. So even though a lot of them have, like, sad stories in their past, like, it's just not the most inspiring thing to read a book about people trying to get a job to make a bunch of money. Um, furthermore, this book is just a ripoff of Ender's Game, and I'm just going to come out and say it. 90% of my enjoyment of this book came from the depiction of the sort of pitting all of these kids against each other as they trained to become proficient enough in the skills they needed to have for the mission to see if they would make it. And that's Ender's Game. So, like, it, that's literally, that's what that book is. And obviously it's a classic, and the person who wrote this book has obviously read it. Um, I just don't see that there's very much in addition to that in this book that is original that in any way contributes to it being good. Everything good about this book is the part of this book that is taken from Ender's Game. The other aspects of this book are the fact that there are no LGBTQ characters whatsoever. There are no less than four couples or, you know, couples in the making in this story. All of them are a girl and a boy. There are no, you know, there's no discussion of gender. This is supposed to be set in the future. There are no genderless people. There are no trans people. There are, is just boys and girls. And there are no gay characters at all. There's no discussion of it. Um, and furthermore, there's, this also contains one of those pointless female characters that only exists to inspire the male hero um, in various ways which she's just a, basically a prop. So that combined with how unoriginal the vast majority of what I think you could consider to be the good part of this book um, is, I think that sentence held together, I'm not completely sure. Uh, all of that combines to just make this book like, uh, I wouldn't recommend anybody spend their time reading it and I don't think I would read it again. It's a series, of course because everything is a series. Everything is a trilogy. You are not allowed to write a book unless it is part of a trilogy now. It is a law. If the other books are on sale for the same deal that I got the first one for, I'll probably buy them and read them because again, completionist. Um, but you know, I hope they're better than this one because this is just Ender's Game. And I haven't read the whole Ender's Game series, so I really ought to just be reading that. It wasn't horribly offensive. Um, so I gave it two stars because I think I only really reserve a one star rating for a book that's like damaging to the world. Like just not being good is not enough to earn a one star rating. A one star rating is like, fuck you book, fuck you. And you know, this book isn't that, it's just like not great. Uh, the next book I read was The Mirror by Marlis Milheiser. Now, this is a book, this is very like out of time, somewhere in time. There's a mirror and it can transport people through time, basically. And this woman, so this, 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 this young woman is gonna get married and she looks in this mirror on the night before her wedding and she is switched with her grandmother on the night before her wedding, like a hundred years before. And so she's out of time and uh, in a culture shock situation. And the first half of the book follows the, the 1978 uh, character um, whose name I don't remember living in the life of her grandmother back in the 1800s and that was very interesting um, the, the book had a lot to say about the sort of the evolution of women's rights and the place of the woman in the home and in society um, and then the second half of the book was the opposite you you followed the the grandmother who from when she was a young woman on the eve of her wedding in 18 something um, living the life of the woman in 1978. And that part of the book was pretty depressing um, and slow moving and uncomfortable and just kind of sad. The part of this book that took place in the 70s was the dystopia. Like, it made, just sort of made you feel like our world is terrible and if only we could live back in the good old, good old days when morality was a thing and people were good to each other. And I just sort of feel like I don't know, that was kind of a downer and I just didn't love it. And it started to get really hard to get through. So I really preferred the first half of this book. I recommended this book to my mother and she ordered it. And I know she started it and I don't know how far she got. Um, it's a little sexually graphic. 
So, and I didn't realize that either before I recommended it to her. So we'll see what she thought. I doubt she finished it. I certainly didn't hate it. I really liked parts of it. Um, and then it kind of let me down. So I gave it three stars and that's the mirror. So there it is. Um, the next book I read was Pathways by Jerry Taylor. And this was a Star Trek Voyager book. Now the first book that she wrote was Mosaic. And that was the backstory of Captain Catherine Janeway, who was the star, the captain of Star Trek Voyager. Pathways tells the story, the backstories of all the other major characters on the show. It's um, told through sort of like a framing narrative of them all being um, all of the all of the major crew members are have been captured by aliens, and then they sit around a campfire and literally just tell their stories. Um, the story of them being captured and all that is like mildly interesting, but not the point. It's all of the sort of um, short stories that are the stories of the, the the backstories of all the characters that that's like the point of the book um, and that was really really fun it was like a anthology of Star Trek Voyager short stories I especially liked Neelix's backstory I don't know it was about like like idealistic childish dreams and fantasy and make-believe and then having to come to terms with the ugly realities of the world and war and suffering and then uh, Tuvok's backstory, which was really fascinating if you like Vulcans, kind of coming to terms with himself. And then I really enjoyed Kess's backstory just because I love the story from that first episode. Really entertaining, some of them more than others, but all of them were better than I expected. A Seven of Nine shows up and she doesn't have anything to say about herself. She's like, well, my backstory basically includes being a Borg drone and murdering people, so maybe someone else should talk. And I thought that was really funny, especially coming from Jerry Taylor, who famously left the show after they brought that character on. But in addition to that, this book is a, you know, a, a book written by one of the creators of a Star Trek series set in that world that includes several gay characters. What? Amazing. Several gay characters um, in a very sort of um, just rote, blasé manner, uh, presenting these characters as though, you know, the fact that there are gay people present in the world in the 24th century is not a big deal. And that, to me, is kind of how it should be presented. Um, and I just thought there were some really sweet moments involving those characters that I just wasn't expecting, and I really appreciated that. That was a really big deal to me. That's not something you get a lot of in Star Trek, unfortunately. So Pathways was, you know, what I expected it to be, but in doing what I knew it was going to do, which was give us these backstories and give us a chance to linger in this universe, it was, it was actually better than I expected it to be. So I really enjoyed Pathways, um, and I gave it four stars. Oh, and this is Pathways, by the way. I didn't hold the book up. I usually read ebooks, you guys, and holding up a physical book is just not something that I'm used to doing. So this is the part where I hold the book up, and then I put it down because I don't feel like holding it. I enjoyed the book, and um, yeah. So the next book that I read was A Knight of the Seven Kingdoms by George R. R. Martin. Now this is an anthology of three novellas that are set in the world of um, Game of Thrones or A Song of Ice and Fire. Um, and they're set about 100 years before the events of Song of Ice and Fire based on the characters that are mentioned. I feel like it can't quite be 100 years, but maybe close to it. In any case, it, it's a prequel. There's just three novellas that are prequels. Um, this concerns the exploits of the knight Sir Duncan the Tall, who's referred to throughout the whole thing as just Dunk, and his squire, Egg. Um, I'm going to put the book down now because I don't like holding books. Um, <sighs> these stories contain all of the gore, all of the fantastic elements, all of the sort of politics and all of the intrigue and the sort of the 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 sort of humor of Game of Thrones, if you've watched the show or read any of the other books, although actually I haven't read any of those other books, so I don't know, maybe the other books aren't like that. Um, I really enjoyed it. I thought it was really, really fun. It was fun to be back in the world again because I like the TV show, um, and I really enjoy. I really like the characters of Dunk and Egg. They had a neat dynamic. Um, you got to see in detail some areas of that world prior to, you know, winter coming and all of the things that take place on the TV show. Um, and you got to hear about and see some of the sort of origins of some characters that are talked about or are almost legendary by the time of A Song of Ice and Fire. 
the illustrations are really amazing. First of all, the book itself, like obviously I showed you the cover and there's the spine, but then here's the back. So this is just like basically a drawing of Sir Duncan the Tall on his trusty steed. But there are, even like when you open up the book, like, you know, here's the book naked. Okay. Here's him meeting the boy that becomes his squire, Egg. And then there are full page illustrations in here. I have actually not read a book as an adult that was illustrated before. And so it was just really, really fun to read and then get to look at these really lovely illustrations. It made me want to read the rest of his books. I don't know, I was whisked away and it was a, it was a surprisingly quick read. I was a little bit intimidated to read it, frankly. Um, I was afraid that I was not gonna be able to get through it or it was gonna be long or slow or hard to read and it wasn't any of those things. I've been told that it's not as dark as A Song of Ice and Fire or as heavy, but I don't, I think the writing style is probably about the same and I could be wrong about that, but I, I get the impression that it's the same writing style. It didn't challenge me or change my life exactly, but it was very escapist and very fun. And I just, I don't know, I had a really great time reading it and I gave that book I gave that book four stars, because again, I think for what it is, it was great. The last book in my challenge had to wait several weeks before I finally read it, and that was Hannah Green and her unfeasibly mundane existence. So I just finished this like last night or a couple of nights ago. It was a very cute narration. I really enjoyed Michael Marshall Smith's um, voice of this, this character of Hannah. I also really enjoyed his depiction of the devil. So basically, this girl has a grandfather who's always on the go, always traveling, and when her parents are separated, she is sent to spend some time with her grandfather, and while she's with him, she discovers that he is acquainted with the devil and has been working with him for most of his life. She gets to know the devil, and then the devil has a major problem, and it has to do with the gateway to hell, and it's putting everybody on the planet in, in danger. And so they go on an adventure and it's scary, of course. Um, her narration is very cute. The devil is actually quite funny um, and fun. It's an interesting mashup of innocent, cute, whimsical writing and like vile, dark, gory, horrible writing. I thought I was reading one book and then there's a scene with the devil where he walks into a warehouse with these guys and he's like, oh, well, I'm the devil. And one of them just explodes. Spoiler alert. It's very early on in the book. I was not expecting that. The depiction of hell is very twisted and very kind of mind bending and odd and dark and confusing as it should be. Um, the second half of the book was just not as great. The second half of the book got bogged down in a lot of that stuff. I don't know. It started to become repetitive and a little bit boring. And unexpectedly, I started having a hard time getting through the book and I started really slowing down in my reading of it. The other aspect of this that I found a little bit off-putting and depressing was that there's a lot of comments by Michael Marshall Smith as he directly addresses the reader about this idea of adulthood being sort of like coming to terms with the real way of the world. And you get the impression that he doesn't think of adulthood as being a very nice experience. Like, being an adult is a terrible thing, and that was kind of unfortunate. Overall, this was a whimsical and fun read. It let me down a little bit, and so although I enjoyed it, I couldn't say that I love it, so I gave it three stars. And that was my Booktubeathon experience. I did not read a book with one hat on the entire time, and I did not watch the film adaptation of Mildred Pierce, and I did not finish seven books in seven days, but I did what I could. And uh, it was definitely an experience that I'm glad I took part in. And maybe next year I will succeed. I have to say I sort of preferred my next readathon, which was five books in seven days, because it was more attainable. Um, and I didn't like the pressure of seven books in seven days. And again, it's not like you have to do that. But that's the goal. So that is my wrap up for Book Tubeathon 2018. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this video, and if you did, please hit the like button or the subscribe button if you so feel so inclined. And uh, 
Uh, hmm. What do I say? Read more books, drink more coffee, and don't forget to sleep. That's right. That's what I say. <laughs> it's been so long. I don't know if that even makes sense anymore since I never sleep. But in any case, remember to read more books, drink more coffee, and don't forget to sleep. Thanks, guys.